Found a nice smokable butt in the street today. This is the Diary of Dr. X 15. How to divide a union and create a sweatshop. Ha! Now I'll be honest. Again, as I always have been, neither my study of the street economy nor the two years I spent in hell working at a local bread plant were undertaken without reason. In the latter case, contract teaching dried up locally and I needed a job. As for the urban scavenging, it was necessary to supplement my meager EI or unemployment payments due to the poverty wages I had been working for in the bread plant for two years. The only good percentage of that. But I used the same methodology as I mentioned, participant observation in both cases. In short, this means actually living the lifestyle you are studying. This brings me to today's theme. You see, if you want to learn how to divide a union, Lower your workers' wages <coughs> to poverty levels and create a sweatshop. You can learn a great deal from the strategies employed by the bread plant I was working in. You see, there are some industries <laughs> where it is just not practical to ship the jobs overseas. Three or four days before the bread reaches the stores, they were fine with Weeks, well, not so much. Recall that the Globe and Mail, one of Canada's national newspapers, rated the parent company of this plant, a major CCCP grocery chain, as one of Canada's top 50 employers during my tenure there. Clearly, it was only being compared to other transnational employers and not to non-unionized small and medium-sized businesses who treat their employees with respect, given what I will describe below. You will also come to understand just why this company was rated as Canada's top diversity employer in 2010. <laughs> you see, the collective agreement I walked into was about the worst possible scenario a new worker could possibly hope to see. Over the past two contracts, you see, the company had introduced tiers, each with a lower starting and maximum pay rate than the previous tiers. Nor was there any hope of promotion to the higher tiers, because membership wasn't based on seniority, but on date of hire. In other words, if you were hired after a certain date, your starting and maximum wage were lower than everyone else permanently. You were just screwed. As a tier three worker, when I was hired, my starting wage was just over $10 per hour. Barely over the minimum wage and a maximum under 15, which took over three years to reach. Tier 2 at a maximum of around 16, with a slightly higher starting rate, while Tier 1, the old timers, had a maximum in the area of $20, back when they used to pay fairly well. One of the old timers told me that his starting rate in the 1980s, 30 years before I was hired, was $13, $3 above mine and just below my top rate 30 years later. He also told me he hadn't had a raise for the past 10 years. What a surprise! There were already Tier 2 machine operators getting only a dollar an hour bonus, 17 per hour, for all the extra responsibility involved in operating the oven, for example, while there were Tier 1 workers who were mindlessly stacking pans for $20 per hour, <laughs> or even 30 to 40 with overtime. Needless to say, 
There were very few new employees who stayed with the company any longer. Not they had any sense, anyways. Those who did were almost entirely recent immigrants, those who stayed, that is. They either didn't know any better, or were simply happy to have any kind of employment. Thus, adding to that diversity employer statistic that the Government of Canada praised this company so highly for. Many of these people could barely read English. Good reason for keeping the job. And good luck understanding the union contract! which was a challenge for me, even, with a Ph.D. What this all meant was that the place was rapidly turning into a sweatshop filled with people from the third world due to its wage structure. As I've mentioned, this also matches the composition of the managerial and supervisory staff the company made a habit of hiring, who were mostly from third world or former communist countries, places with little respect for unions or workers' rights. Shortly before my back problems came up and the company began harassing me out of my job, which I mentioned, the union contract was due to expire. There was a lot of discussion of this and of the new contract negotiations at that time, shortly before I left. I recall sitting at the picnic table in the back parking lot over lunch, which is where a lot of people went, discussing our contract with several of the Tier 1 workers, the old-timers, who were virtually the only native-born Canadians left in the place, by the way. This union has absolutely no solidarity left, I said. What do you mean? Of course it does, one of them replied. Are you kidding, I said. There are three tiers here. Each has different interests. And as far as the tier two and three workers are concerned, they could care less whether you guys in the first tier ever get a raise again until they are making the same money as you and have the opportunity or have the opportunity to. Because the situation right now is completely unfair. All the company has to do is offer us a buck an hour raise close the gap between us and you, while giving you nothing, and we'll vote for it. Hell, even a signing bonus would do. So don't ever expect a raise again as long as this tier system is in place because it has completely divided the union against itself. Well, one of them said, when they introduced it, we didn't think it was worth going out on strike over didn't affect our wages at the time. Well, it does now, doesn't it? Silence. So if you are in a unionized environment and you see this type of tiered system proposed, vote to strike! Period! Or you are on the slippery slope to a sweatshop just as I observed in this situation. Because believe me, the centralized planners are doing everything they can to reduce our wages to third world levels. And this is one means of doing so. That's what free trade is all about. It puts workers in competition with others on a global scale. We call it the race to the bottom. In the social science literature. This implies that first world wages can be forced down to third world levels by various means, including especially free trade. And I've seen it in operation firsthand, right here in Winnipeg.